Welcome to Cross-Border Tax Talks, where we discuss the latest trends in international taxation. From President Biden's campaign proposals to the OECD's latest developments. I'm Doug McConey, PwC's U.S. International Tax Services Leader. You can find me on Twitter at XBorderTax. On this week's episode of Cross-Border Tax Talks, I'm honored to have Will Morris back on the podcast. Will is PwC's Deputy Global Tax Policy Leader. Prior to joining PwC, Will spent 17 years at General Electric directing GE's Global Tax Policy Program. From 1995 to 1997, Will worked at the IRS, and from 97 to 2000, worked in the Office of Tax Policy at the U.S. Treasury. Will was appointed chair of the American Chamber of Commerce to the European Union in Brussels, and also chair of the Business and Industries Advisory Committee, or BIAC, to the OECD in Paris. Will, welcome back to the Cross-Border Tax Talks podcast. Thanks, Kimmy. Glad to be here. Well, and it's great for, for those that are joining the podcast on YouTube. I appreciate the little BIAC flag um, over, your, uh, over your right shoulder. And there we go. Uh, Will, is, Will, is, Will is waving that for us. And so you might want to check that out on YouTube if you're listening to the, the podcast on a more traditional platform. <laughs> but maybe before we get, begin, Will, uh, uh, an important question for you. you. You relocated from London to the U.S. when you joined... PwC a, a couple years ago. So an important question, are you regretting that move at this point with everything taking place in the U.S. from the coronavirus to the election and, and everything we're seeing? Are, are there any regrets there, Will, or are you happy to be back? Um, I am happy to be back. Uh, there are very few regrets. I'm surrounded by all the things that I had in London. But, you know, I think to, the main point is the past year has been crazy. Absolutely. Um, and the UK has certainly been no exception to that. I mean, the UK has been at the focus of uh, uh, many of the COVID problems for, for quite a long time. So, you know, I'm just, I, I'm glad to be here. Uh, I actually love DC. We, we lived here uh, back in the 90s. Uh, it feels like coming home. So now I'm, I'm glad to be here. And great colleagues, of course, in an office that I never see, but uh, great colleagues. Right. Yeah, I haven't seen you in the office in well over a year at this point because we haven't we haven't been there. Um, so, uh, in fact, I think the last time I saw you in person was uh, at, at the last conference that we had right before the, the quarantine. So uh, I think we all look Indeed. forward to getting back into the office at, at some point. All right. So let's turn to the topic at hand, which is, you know, international tax policy, specifically wanted to get an update on on BEPS 2.0, which I will note for our listeners, Will has explained before on the prod podcast that he believes is a misnomer. But uh, as I've said, that that horse has left the barn. We're going to be calling this thing BEPS 2.0, regardless what happens to it. But for, for those that are interested in the details of, of Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 proposals, we discussed these on a prior cross-border Tax Talks podcast from October 30th. We'd encourage listeners to check that out if they want more details on the proposals themselves. What I'm interested in hearing from you, Will, it's February 2021. There's been some commitments and hopes, I think, for the OECD to reach consensus by the end of the year. Can you give us an update on, on where things are? There were inclusive framework meetings at the end of January. I know there's some additional meetings in February. Talk a little bit about the timeline and what the expectations are with respect to Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 BEPS 2.0 proposals. Uh, sure. So firstly, I, I'll let BEPS 2.0 go. You're right. There's been far too much water under the bridge to uh, uh, to go on about that one. Um, the timeline is, is interesting. I mean, it, in fact, what they're talking about is the middle of the year uh, and the, the G20 um, uh, finance ministers uh, reaffirmed that as recently as last month. Um, so that, you know, that, that timetable is, is still ongoing. Uh, whether it's realistic uh, or doable um, is, a, is a slightly different issue. And as we've discussed before, I think that we, when we discussed this the last time that we met, um, you know, a lot hangs on what the word agreement means. Uh, is this a truly comprehensive multilateral agreement that ties down every single detail, or is this, you know, at its at its highest level, an agreement to agree? Um, so I think quite a lot hangs on the definition. As you know, the idea, having seen these blueprints now, um, you know, with six hundred pages long uh, on pillars one uh, and two, um, large amounts of detail, but not agreed for the most part 
uh, between countries. In fact, I mean, the whole of the none of the blueprints represents uh, any sort of an international agreement. These are OECD documents, but obviously they do reflect some level of agreement. Some of the deep, some of the uh, items in there, but there are many un, you know, still uh, undecided items on some very big issues uh, around scope. For example, you know, are we going to stick with automated digital services and consumer facing, or are we going to go broader than that, or are we going to go narrower than that, or are we going to raise the thresholds? Are we going to lower the thresholds? You know, what about some some very large sectors um, which don't know whether they're in or out? Pharma is, um, you know, the biggest example in there, but there are some other very substantial ones as well. You know, what is the rate going to be? What is the mechanism going to be? Who are the surrender countries going to be? What are we going to do with losses? What are we going to do with credits? You know, all of those things remain to be decided. Um, and it does, you know, that detailed agreement looks like a, a pretty long shot. That said, um, you know, there the remains a lot of enthusiasm, uh, certainly at the at the very highest political levels, uh, to make this work. You were you were talking about the inclusive framework meeting uh, last week. Uh, it was the week before last. Now, uh, the end of January. It was an interesting meeting because it was held in public for the first time. Now, you you know, you could say, well, okay, they did that to uh, to shed a little more light on it. I mean, equally, I think probably the real reason why they did it is because they're waiting to see what the new US administration does. And until then, there was no point uh, in having private meetings to discuss something which might or might not come to pass. But one of the most interesting things was an hour, I think it was an hour, it may have been slightly longer, with six finance ministers from some pretty key countries, including Germany, uh, the UK, um, uh, Indonesia, which takes over the G20 presidency uh, after the Italians, um, the Italian finance minister, um, uh, and, you know, they were all talking about how hopeful they were, how, how close this was to being carried over the line. And yet, again, you look back to what the, the fundamental stumbling block in Pillar 1 is being, and that has been the U.S.'s um, insistence, its red line, that the digital economy can't be ring-fenced. And that wasn't just the Trump administration, it wasn't just Secretary Mnuchin who came up with that. That was the position of the Obama administration as well. It's embedded... Uh, in the uh, Action 1, which was, uh, you know, the BEPS Action 1 uh, on the taxation of the digital economy in that report, which was issued back in 2015. So, you know, there are consistent positions here. If you listen to uh, to, to the noises coming out from the Hill, um, you know, particularly at the staff level, but speaking about what they think the members, how the members are going to react, uh, again, you know, some, some skepticism uh, about Pillar 1. Um, you know, what have they got to prove? Well, for everybody has to know what the revenue impacts are and the revenue impacts uh, are very unclear. Uh, even if the revenue impacts aren't disadvantageous to the US, um, uh, we're hearing that nevertheless, you know, members are going to want to know that there are other things in this uh, for the US. Uh, and even if those criteria, those, those criteria are met uh, about revenue and other benefit to the US, given that this, you know, quite possibly veering away from international norms, then what is the what fits, uh, the reasons for doing that? What are the other advantages that are in there? Uh, and, you know, absent pinning down all the details, it's hard to answer those questions. Um, so, you know, I, I think that while there's a lot of enthusiasm uh, to, to move this over the line, quite how it gets moved over the line uh, is unclear because, you know, many of the big problems uh, still there now. You know how the new administration deals with this uh, is going to be uh, is going to be an interesting question. Not a great deal of time between now and mid July. There are, there are a bunch of meetings to be sure. Um, there's a, a meeting February uh, I think 26 and 27, the G20 finance ministers meeting. That'll be Secretary Yellen's first meeting with uh, her fellow finance ministers, and she will probably come under pressure at that point uh, to. Uh, you know, to move this forward. But what we've seen so far, uh, you know, through her uh, confirmation testimony to the Senate Finance Committee, and then through the, the so-called QFRs, the, the written responses after that, um, was strong support for Pillar 2 for a, for a minimum tax, uh, which obviously we already have in the form of guilty, uh, to stop a race to the bottom. Um, but clearly some questions uh, in her mind, and presumably the mind of her officials, uh, about uh, moving forward on digital taxation uh, in a dramatically different way to uh, to what's been talked about before.
So let's talk a little bit about that because I think that's very interesting. And as you mentioned, uh, Janet Yellen has has been confirmed um, as the the next Treasury Secretary. Um, what do you see as you know any changes in in the U.S. position and how may that continue to 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 develop, uh, particularly given some of the appointees that we've seen um, to Treasury, including some a number of academics that have weighed in publicly on on a number of matters. And one of those examples is a UCLA, UCLA law professor Kim Clossing, who recently authored an article on uh, potentially moving guilty to a country by country position um, as we've discussed here on the, the the podcast before but given those appointments and with Janet Yellen and with the overall Biden administration how do you see that playing out in in the US and obviously we'll see with with the meeting at the end of February which will be you know the Biden administration's first time joining that group but what do you anticipate from from the US side yeah, I mean, it's it's very interesting because I think one development that, that very few people had expected um, was to have essentially a full Treasury tax team uh, in place, you know, within a couple of weeks of, um, of, the, of the new administration starting. Uh, if you look back to, to the beginning of the Trump administration, I don't think Dave Cotter was uh, confirmed as Assistant Secretary until August, and Chip Harter didn't come in as uh, DAS International until, uh, until September. And you know, now we have... Uh, we have, as you say, Kim Klausing, who's coming in as the uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Tax Analysis. But we also have Ty Grinberg uh, in a brand new role, which is uh, a DAS for, for multilateral tax, which means, for the moment at least, the OECD. Um, so there are, uh, you know, there are a number of things that, in terms of, of Pillar 1, um, you know, despite the fact that uh, a number of the officials coming in um, particularly from academia, uh, have a reputation for not being, uh, you know, particularly pro-business. Uh, on pillar one, they've all they've all taken relatively consistent positions, uh, which is that you know, firstly, the proposals which are out there are, are very complex, too complex, probably. Um, uh, also, that that there doesn't appear to be a clear uh, animating principle, if you will, uh, which underlies them, particularly as it relates to scope, uh, and therefore not. You know, a huge amount of enthusiasm for for the current pillar one, uh, and certainly, uh, although he's not a, a member of the administration, clearly very well connected. Um, uh, at the inclusive framework, there was a panel of economists before the finance ministers talked, and Jason Furman was one of those, and talked about um, uh, you know the pillar one project in terms of um, I think the word he used was steal stealing revenue, um, which is obviously a pretty strong term. Um, so again. You know, a dramatic turnaround on uh, on taxing the digital economy, uh, and essentially on ceding those taxing rights to other countries, um, uh, without you know some some compensation for the U.S. I think is uh, is quite unlikely. You know, there's there's liable to probably to be more of a change, uh, perhaps in relation to Pillar Two. Uh, although you know, one of the interesting things about Pillar Two, so this is a minimum tax regime, income inclusion rule, which looks very much like guilty. Which would be backed up by an undertax payment rule, which is a less perfect analog of uh, uh, of beat. Um, and you know, Secretary Yellen um, uh, and a number of the the incoming officials have spoken favourably uh, about the minimum tax. They've spoken favourably about a country by country version uh, of the minimum tax, as opposed to the aggregate ETR um, uh, calculation, which is done uh, under uh, under guilty. Um, but, you know, equally, one of the things that has to be borne in mind is that despite the fact that the EU seems to be very keen on pushing for, uh, for a minimum tax, uh, both the IIR and the UTPR version of this, there are a bunch of countries that aren't. And the UK is probably the most articulate about this. But the position that they take um, relatively clearly is that they view the imposition of Pillar 2 uh, on their own companies essentially as being an advantage to the US uh, and particularly to US companies, because what it does is impose the same, those same minimum tax burdens uh, on UK companies, for example, as are currently imposed on US companies. Uh, and they therefore think that actually, you know, pillar two in a sense is doing the US a favor. Um, uh, and therefore, you know, they, they have their questions about that. 
Now, you know, there, there's been plenty of speculation about does the guilty rate um, get raised? Uh, do they move to country by country? Things which could toughen up um, uh, guilty uh, to something which would make it considerably stronger than what the current Pillar 2 proposals look like. Um, but, you know, I, I think that we'll have to see how that goes. You know, at the moment, uh, most of the discussion and you know, most of what, if to the extent that our listeners have been paying uh, attention to this, they will say, well, isn't guilty meant to be, you know, accepted, grandfathered, uh, or more appropriately treated as a compliant pillar two regime, and therefore we wouldn't be subject to it? Well, yes is the answer to that. Um, but, you know, I think that there are other countries who don't, who don't see it quite the same way. So it'll be interesting to see how this progresses. A number of people have said, well, maybe pillar two could move forward without pillar one. But go back to what I just said about the UK, and not just the UK, but a bunch of other countries who say, well, why would we give this to the US, particularly if there's a pass essentially on uh, on pillar two because of guilty, uh, if the US won't give us what we want in terms of digital taxation, digital taxation in particular, uh, in pillar one. Um, so, you know, to, to my mind, despite the fact that there seems to be more enthusiasm for pillar two, pillar two is in some senses, or it, it is hideously complex, really, truly hideously complex. Um, but pillar two being more advanced in terms of the technical details, I don't think from a political point of view, there's much chance of them moving separately, uh, at least for the moment. It, it, along those lines, um, you know, e even if consensus is is reached, um, including with, with the U.S., do international policymakers appreciate the challenges in the U.S. of, of getting <laughs> treaties changed, if that's what would be required, presumably for Pillar 1, or even just domestic legislation? And, I mean, I'm sure that they saw it with the TCJA, but yet we had these new you know, novel concepts of guilty and beat introduced. But, you know, even if can, it, it, whatever likelihood that there would be consensus reached, including the U.S., there still seems to be some general challenges of, of getting these rules implemented in, in, in a number of jurisdictions. And we'll come to the EU in a minute, but let's start with the U.S. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's, look, it's a great question. And you would be surprised how many foreign policy makers know who the junior, sen junior senator from Kentucky is. Um, uh, they are well aware of the difficulty of, um, uh, of getting U.S. treaties through. And, you know, likewise, um, you know, having seen TCGA go through, uh, they know even that, that legislation with a simple majority is hard enough. So there is an appreciation of that. Uh, at the same time, um, there's not endless patience. Uh, and I, I hear that time and time again uh, from foreign governments. We understand how difficult it is, but that can't be a reason for us not to do anything. And, you know, I think that is one of the big changes that's taken place since I was at the Treasury. Uh, is that the rest of the world now won't wait. And that, that in part, is because of what happened during BEPS, um, when essentially we took the, the view that we could step aside and the rest of the world could move on. Uh, and, you know, they've gotten a bit of a taste for that. Um, and, you know, they're not, as I say, they're not prepared uh, to wait forever. You know, that said, I think if there was a, if the Biden administration did find a way to thread this needle uh, and... Uh, countries thought that there was a realistic possibility of the U.S. signing up to this and legislating uh, fairly quickly. Then the timeline, I think, would be willingly extended. Um, but, uh, you know, equally, there are a number of other things which are running here, including uh, what the EU, EU needs to do in relation to its funding its own recovery package, um, which mean that there are some pretty hard deadlines on the other side as well. So, yeah, there is an understanding of that. There's an appreciation of it. Um, and there is some willingness to accommodate it. Um, but I wouldn't overstate how much. Yeah, along those lines in the EU, there was a case that came out, Will, in, in January of 2021 from the European Court of Justice. And notably, the case was, I think, published in over 15 different languages. English was not one of those. <laughs> and I, I, I assume yeah. that had something to do with Brexit, but uh, we can leave that for, for, for another podcast. The, the holding, my understanding, is that the, the Court of Justice determined that Sweden's interest deduction denial rules, rules for intergroup loans to, and payments to other EU members infringed EU rights around freedom of establishment. And, and, and my, that certainly kind of the, my antenna went up is like, well, how then could they introduce kind of pillar two um, if there were payments between member states? And we know that there are a variety of different tax rates in Europe. 
is it possible that the EU won't be able to square this freedom of establishment with a pillar two type concept? And does that create another potential hurdle to, to actually get these rules implemented? Uh, I I actually think yes is the answer. Um, you know, I'm, just to be very clear, I'm not a, an EU specialist. Um, but I think that there have been problems since the beginning. And in fact, if you go back to some of the ATAD proposals uh, and look at those, a number of people have said, look, you know, the exit tax, for example, seems to run completely contrary to EU. And, you know, the, the, the EU has taken a bet um, that by doing something in a directive um, that the court will say, OK, well, that's fine. We'll, we'll accept that. Um, but, you know, that isn't clear. Uh, it really isn't clear. And one of the interesting things about this case, Lexal, it's called, by the way, uh, and it will apparently eventually <laughs> will apparently eventually appear in English. But um, uh, if any of your other languages are better than that, then uh, go ahead and read it right now. Um, but, you know, what's about the Lexal case was that the court didn't even ask for an advocate general's opinion, apparently. Um, they regarded it as such a straightforward issue um, that they just they just went straight ahead uh, and decided it. It is completely of a piece with a lot line of cases that includes Eurowings, for example, and I think also Cadbury Schweppes. Um, and, you know, it is possible that if this gets passed as a, as a directive, all 27 countries agree that the that the European court will say, okay, well, that, that makes it slightly different. Um, it is possible that um, some novel reasons for, uh, you know, for agreeing to it could be accepted, uh, or not so novel reasons, um, you know, in terms of stopping tax avoidance, for example. But um, it's 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 not it's very far from clear that the court would change those would change its position on those things. So I think you know there has to be an issue, as there has been all along, uh, about this. Um, so you know a, again, a, a lot of this a lot of this project, uh, as as also happened with BEPS, uh, really is about using perception to create reality, uh, and. European law has always been a sort of an inconvenient truth in in, um, uh, in this area. Uh, and this, you know, I think this is something which has to be worked through. I, I know from talking to some of the governments in the EU that they've considered this, considered the Excel case, felt comfortable uh, that they would be able to find their way around it. Um, go ahead uh, with the directive um, and the directive will come into law. Uh, and it'll then have to be challenged and taken to the court. So, you know, people are going to have to deal with it. It's not something which stops it, you know, in advance. Um, but, you know, down the road, is it possible that, that this could run into that roadblock? Yeah, I think it, it, I think it, it's a real possibility. It'll certainly be interesting to see how it plays out on, uh, on both sides of the pond. Um, let's move yeah. to digital taxes, Will. And and I, I, I actually think that this is another misnomer for, frankly, unilateral, unilateral actions taken by, by different countries. And we've seen a number of them in a number of different forms. And I was hoping, I just wanted to go through through a handful of them. There's certainly you know, many sure. more than the ones we're going to discuss. And maybe if you could just provide a brief overview of, of what is it and what we might anticipate um, from these uh, from these various countries. The the first one that I wanted to, to get your reaction to was was something that was, was recently reported in, um, in London Sunday Times with respect to an online sales tax and as well as an excess profits tax. Th these are, my understanding, in addition to the existing taxes like the diverted profits tax in the UK. Um, tell us a little bit about that and uh, where that might be headed. Yeah, so I mean the UK is to be a real, <laughs> a real laboratory for tax ideas. Um, and you know, uh, uh, others of our listeners will know about the offshore receipts tax and various other inventive things as well. So the, the online sales tax has been talked about for, for about a year, would be in addition to the digital services tax. Um, what the online sales tax is about is, is a, f a fight which has been going on for a while now. And it, it, you know, this shows up in different countries in different ways, but essentially between physical retailers and online retailers. And in the UK, the, the issue is about of uh, real estate taxes uh, for businesses, which, which can be quite onerous. Um, and this is uh, an effort um, by the physical retailers to try and um, equalize um, uh, the tax payment. So this would be an online tax. This would be an online sales tax uh, on electronic sales uh, to try to equalize that 
out what the rate would be. We don't know. Um, uh, you know, it, it looks like uh, it would obviously be in addition to a VAT. Um, uh, so that that's one thing. The excess profits tax, um, as traditional excess profits taxes are, um, is generally a one-off tax uh, in particularly profitable years, sometimes called a windfall profits tax. Um, you know, the oil companies have suffered it uh, over the years a lot. Um, the argument here would be that um, you know, the online retailers have done very well, uh, particularly during the COVID crisis, and therefore uh, additional profits should be, uh, uh, you know, should be taxed uh, at a higher rate. The interesting thing about this is, and again, we don't know a great deal about it, and I, I suspect that this was um, a trial balloon being floated, which, which may not come to anything immediately. But the interesting thing is that excess profits taxes are uh, almost by definition um, levied on profits uh, arising in a country. Um, one of the things about this is that if they're going to be levied on online, uh, on online retailers, those aren't profits uh, which are currently located in the UK. And that's the whole point of Pillar 1 uh, and Amount A. So there would have to be some type of reallocation to the UK in order for the excess profits tax then to be levied on it. So there are a number of um, you know, interesting technical questions which have to be answered uh, before you could get to that form of an excess profits tax. But again, you know, I, I, we, we need to watch out for all of these things because if you look at the huge amount of government money that's been spent on the, you know, just during the COVID crisis, forget recovery for a second, um, uh, and the perception, you know, that sort of melds with the narrative um, that online companies have done very, very, very well. Um, you know, that's a pretty uh, strong incentive for countries responding to their citizens uh, to come up with these, you know, more of these types of taxes. Absolutely. So let, let's move to the other side of, of the world, India, um, and their equalization levy, which has gotten quite a bit of, of press. W what is that? And uh, what are we hearing on, on, on the implementation that, uh, of the uh, equalization levy? Right. So the equalization levy started life in India as a, uh, advertising payments out of India to, uh, to foreign advertising. Uh, sellers. And that was a 6% rate. Uh, however, last year, uh, India introduced a, an expanded equalization levy uh, to cover effectively all online sales um, into India um, by uh, Indian persons uh, or using Indian data. So really, some quite um, tenuous touch points with India uh, uh, being used to, to justify this 2% uh, gross revenue tax. Um, it, it was started to be collected uh, fairly early on. The, the details were, were scant. It was effective uh, before there was uh, much out there. Um, the, in the most recent budget, they, they produced some clarifications, some of which were helpful, which at least some people think expanded it still further. Uh, to uh, uh, to cover other types of transactions, but again, you know, this is this is a much broader uh, type of tax, and you know, has maybe some similarities with what the UK is talking about uh, in relation to the online sales tax. But it essentially is an e-commerce tax, uh, and therefore much broader than social media um, uh, advertising uh, and you know the sale of data, which was the core uh, of the EU DSTs. So. You know, with that, what we've seen with India is that actually this idea is also beginning to catch fire uh, in other parts of the world as well. Indonesia last summer uh, introduced something quite similar. Um, uh, what they had there was um, what they called, uh, I think, an electron electronic transactions tax, uh, which uh, if there, was a, uh, a, uh, there wasn't a treaty, uh, they would deem a PE to exist. Um, uh, if there was a treaty, then they would use this electronic transactions tax instead. So if you can't do it under a profits tax because a treaty stands in the way, then instead you can do it uh, this different, um, uh, uh, you know, sort of getting around the treaty issue uh, and looking at gross revenues as well. And I think, unfortunately, uh, we're probably going to see more of these gross revenue taxes um, uh, in expanded settings, uh, as I said, beyond the, uh, the narrow European uh, DSTs that we saw uh, starting off in 2018.
That's right. And it's interesting to me, Will, the the wake that is created by what I think many of these uh, jurisdictions view as kind of a targeted or very specific tax and obviously starts to impact other industries beyond those that were arguably ta- the targets of, of this tax. Oh, yeah. You had mentioned there's a whole bunch of these in, in the EU. We're not going to go, we're not going to go through those one by one, but with similar themes. But one interesting development um, in the EU that I want wanted you to discuss was a recent decision in France related to a, a permanent establishment for, for somebody in the industry. And uh, again, I'm wondering, is this kind of a, another way that the jurisdictions, um, taxing authorities may be able to go after some of these profits um, as, as opposed to, you know, actually implementing a, a new digital service type tax and instead look at it from the PE route? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a great point. So this was a, a French case about uh, a PE uh, coming out of Ireland. Um, again, it was a, it was a digital company. Um, and there are, there are a number of novel uh, uh, aspects to the interpretation, which I won't go into. But I think, you know, the key point and, and what you're getting to here is that there are, you know, essentially seen as a two or three ways uh, of getting at this issue. Um, the first is the gross revenue route, which is the DST route, which is Asian levy route. Um, but the other is um, changing unilaterally, if possible, um, the profits tax rules and particularly the treaty rules. Uh, and therefore, in this case, you know, the PE rules. So lowering the threshold so that you bring something uh, inside of uh, a country's you know, tax jurisdiction uh, and then impose tax on it. Uh, and that, you know, to extent, to a certain extent, is what the DPT uh, did in the UK back in 2015. Uh, it's what a number of service PE provisions have done uh, in the intervening years. Uh, and again, that's what this case does as well. Um, it says, no, in this case, there's a dependent agent PE, uh, and that gives us the right to uh, to tax this. We don't know what that is because it's been um, uh, sent back to, uh, to the lower court for a decision on that. Um, but it is an important um, a uh, unilateral interpretation of the treaty. And, you know, one of the things which has been talked about uh, in relation to the to aspects of this project is what can be done, um, you know, by interpretation, by changing the commentaries. And the position up until now, including the position taken by the US Treasury, is that a lot of this, you would have to change the treaties. You'd have to, um, you know, in our case, pass things uh, through the Senate. Uh, but what the French Constitutional Court has done here is essentially to uni- is to unilaterally change the interpretation of the French treaty um, uh, based on, I think, if, I, if I'm remembering this right, uh, on uh, things which have transpired since the original treaty was entered into, uh, which again is, is relatively novel interpretation. So I think we're going to see more of this type of uh, perhaps judicial stretching, perhaps administrative stretching uh, to try and extend PE concepts uh, so the profits tax rules can then be brought into uh, into play in this area as well. So I think, you know, again, that's a development well worth watching. Yeah, and, and one has to presume that that other jurisdictions are, are following that as well to, to use as, as potentially, you know, the arrow in their quiver to go after these profits. So maybe we'll, we'll end things, Will, with what can and should taxpayers be doing? I mean, I just feel like, you know, you've been doing this longer than me. I've been in, involved in, in, in the profession for over, over 20 years. And at no time have, have we seen just this amount of changes. And then given, you know, COVID and the macroeconomic environment, and we know that governments are going to be looking for for money, particularly after as the economy starts to, to, to rev back up and thinking of paying for, you know, all the various relief provisions that various territories have, have implemented. What what can and should taxpayers do, if anything? Or is it just like, hey, we need to wait for things to, to, to play out um, to, to, to really see? Uh, it, it is a tough question. Um, and, you know, for some people, the OECD and the EU seem an awful long way away. Um, and then, you know, other people say, well, you know, you've just been saying it's going to be very hard for them to reach agreement. So do we need to worry about this? The answer is yes, you do need to worry about this um, because, you know, other countries are going to do things. And what we've seen in the last segment when we were talking about DSTs, but not just DSTs, but, you know, e-commerce taxes, uh, changes in treaty interpretation, it's that countries are going to do that. Uh, and if you're a multinational, this is going to affect you. It's going to affect you one way or another, whether it's through a multilateral agreement or whether it's through countries 
you know, picking bits and pieces they like out of an OECD uh, document, even if it's not, you know, formally agreed to, and doing that. So th I think there are, there are and the first is to continue to pay attention. And I know that's so much easier to say than it is to do. Um, you know, the bandwidth, bandwidth issues are a problem. We saw it at the end of the last administration. It was thousands and thousands, 7,000 pages of regs coming out. Uh, and, you know, likewise, with possible changes under the Biden administration, uh, people are looking at those. But just don't ignore the rest of the world. Um, you know, if you only pay attention to this once a week, once every two weeks, then at least do that. The second is, you know, if you do have, a, you know, more than one or two countries in which you do business, then, you know, there are ways to model out what the impacts of, of this could be. Um, uh, there are ways to, to model out pillar one, there are ways to pillar two. There are increasingly ways to model out the DST as well. Um, and, you know, this doesn't, this doesn't require a huge amount of detail uh, on what the DSTs are. The, some of these models are fairly simple. But I think having some idea of what that is is important. Um, and that's where I think where the modeling comes in uh, to get, you know, sort of senior management's attention to this uh, and what it is that's coming down the road uh, and potentially coming down the road you know, relatively soon uh, in a 6, 12, 18 month period. So, you know, pay attention, but also try and get a grip on the numbers. Uh, and if it's only, you know, what the worst case scenario is, then I think, again, that's that's an incredibly valuable thing to do. Yeah, and really just communicating to management the uncertainty and the potential oh, yeah. risks for an organization, I think, is really important. Well, as those developments occur, we'll continue to follow those on the cross-border tax talks, yep. and uh, we'll bring you back for those developments. So uh, thanks for joining this week, Will. You bet. Thanks for inviting me, Doug. So thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of Cross-Border Tax Talks. Thanks again to Will Morris, PwC's Deputy Global Tax Policy Leader. I'm Doug McConey, PwC's International Tax Services Leader in the U.S. Stay tuned in two weeks for another exciting edition of the Cross-Border Tax Talks podcast. This podcast is brought to you by PwC, all rights reserved. PwC refers to the U.S. member firm or one of its subsidiaries or affiliates and may sometimes refer to the PwC network. Each member firm is a separate legal entity. Please see www.pwc.com structure for further details. This podcast is for general information purposes only and should not be used as a substitute for consultation with professional advisors.